Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody. I am really pleased to present uh, our speaker today, Christina McCluskey. I don't know Christina well, but um, from our um, limited interactions, I think I would describe her as a, a cheerful force of nature. And I mean that in a good way. Uh, Christina is, is presently a doctoral student uh, in atmospheric science at CSU. Uh, she's poised to receive her PhD anytime now, defending later this year. Uh, that will come after a three month stint at PNNL uh, with a modeling group there, and that's for a uh, DOE Graduate Student Research Program Award. And uh, in addition, she was just awarded an ASP postdoc here jointly with uh, EOL and CGD, so we're gonna be seeing her quite a bit in the, in the near future. Um, her area of research is uh, investigation of ice nucleation particles um, associated with sea spray, biomass burning, forest environments and pollution, and with an eye toward representation of cloud properties in global climate models. Uh, she's a veteran of numerous field campaigns and she has won a number of student awards. Um, today, she's gonna tell us about studies of marine ice nucleating particles and implications for aerosol cloud interactions. Christina. Thank you. Um, thank you for everyone making the trip out here. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speaking to you guys about work we've been doing up at Colorado State. So as, Brian, uh, as Mike mentioned, I am a PhD student. I work with Sonia Crydenwise's his research group, um, primarily with Paul DeMont um, on ice nucleation research. And we've been doing lots of field studies and I've sort of picked out my favorites to tell um, what I think are the, the, the best parts of the PhD so far. Um, and so I hope that you walk away from this talk with an appreciation for marine INPs and their unique behavior um, and are motivated to see more about how we can do better in modeling these in global climate models. So I'm gonna start out with this plot showing the um, absorbed solar radiation mean bias from the CMIP3 analysis. And they found that significant biases in the modeled energy budgets were attributed to poor representation of Southern Ocean clouds. Um, and so that is depicted here as these red hotspots where um, clouds are just poorly represented in these global climate models consistently um, over these ocean regions, which are these blue zonal mean uh, biases there. Looking a little bit more into this, um, an analysis by K et al. took the CAM model and applied a Calypso simulator where they can distinguish between different cloud phases. Um, this is showing the Southern Ocean, so this is the South Pole here, and the distribution of liquid and ice clouds and the cloud cover bias. So this is the bias of the model um, and how basically how poorly or good it is at simulating these different phases. And so we can see that, at least in the case of the NCAR CAM model, we have an overrepresentation of ice clouds and an underrepresentation of supercooled liquid clouds. And so this is um, just one of many demonstrations that cloud phase distributions are pretty poorly represented in um, global climate models, especially in regions such as this. Um, and so this is motivating um, looking more at ice nucleation and ice phase transitions. Um, and just to get everyone up to speed, we um, this is showing a occurrence frequency for clouds um, globally, where I have the therm uh, isotherms labeled here, the melting layer and the homogeneous freezing layer. In the liquid regime, we talk a lot about how aerosols change cloud condensation nuclei populations. Um, and the Ice cloud regime, we think more about homogeneous freezing. So CCN are still important because it determines the number of cloud droplets that can reach like, these levels. But homogeneous freezing is our primary mechanism for forming ice. And in between this mixed phase region, we have to consider CCN and also ice nucleating particles. Ice nucleating particles are particles that are quite rare in the atmosphere, but they promote ice formation at these heterogeneous temperatures meaning that we can have primary ice formation, which then also can lead to secondary ice formation um, and cloud glaciation, which also promotes precipitation. 
We in our group typically think about immersion freezing nucleation. There are other modes, but in case anybody cares, that's what we, we typically think about. Um, this is considered at the moment the most commonly occurring mode of ice nucleation in nature, um, but also most of the studies focus on immersion freezing anyways. We look at, in our group, many sources um, of aerosols and how they can contribute to the IMP population. So this is a, a figure from one of Paul's papers in 2010 that's been modified recently, where we have our different aerosol sources at the bottom here. So biomass burning, biological emissions from, from forests, forests um, urban industrial emissions and dust emissions, which we now consider to be one of the most important our most common um, and potent emission, our source of ice nucleating particle. And then we also have oceanic emissions, which are poorly characterized at the moment. So this has been where my focus has been for the last um, about four years. We think that the abundance of ice nucleating particles actually may play an important role in remote cloud phase tra transitions, um, and, and maybe in a slightly unexpected way. So. If we look at a temperature spectrum of INP concentrations, which is the, the common spectra we're going to be looking at today, so INP concentrations are on the, the y-axis and temperature on the x. These are data from a paper in 2016 from our group where we have data from ambient marine boundary layer samples in blue, um, laboratory-generated sea spray aerosol in red, and historical measurements back from the 70s, um, those ranges are reported in the, these black lines. And so what we find is that actually these ion concentrations associated with sea spray aerosol are generally much lower than those associated with terrestrial emissions. So in gray, I'm showing um, ad additional data, but this is from an agricultural area where they're um, performing harvesting. So there's a lot of plant material and dust and things being kicked up into the atmosphere. And so this is just showing the contrast of that. And so when I, when I see that the abundance of isolated particles associated with sea spray aerosol may play an important role, I mean more about their unique inactive um, ability to serve as an ice nuclei. So they're relatively lower ice nucleation for a given mass or surface area of aerosol when you're looking at sea spray versus a terrestrial aerosol type. And so it's important to distinguish these two types um, when we're looking at aerosol cloud interactions in modeling studies. But I've also showed on here this, these green points, which are um, measurements made in the laboratory, but during a period of elevated biological activity that we can do in these mesocosm experiments. And you can see that ice nucleation concentrations can increase um, somewhat up to terrestrial levels um, at these cooler temperatures, also somewhat at these warmer temperatures. And so this is just one um, example of, of this process. But just to take us all the way back to the 70s, um, this hypothesis, this link between biological activity in the ocean and the ice nucleation activity of sea spray aerosol coming from those oceans was proposed back in the 70s, um, where this is showing number of concentrations, are, are the numbers listed here, number of concentrations of ice nucleation, ice nucleating particles per cubic meter of air. And in the shaded regions, they've highlighted, this is sort of a contour you can think of, of these maximum IN concentrations. So IN concentrations greater than 30 IN per cubic meter. And they suggest that the spatial correlation of these peaks coincide with um, these dotted lines, which are representing areas of ocean convergence. So the idea is that when you have two ocean um, water masses colliding, then you have an upsource of nutrients and a mixing of nutrients that then lead to biological productivity. This is all a spatial correlation though, right? And so this is just a hypothesis. So this has been sort of entertained though in recent years because of the importance of understanding IN in these ocean remote regions. And so just to give you um, a background on marine organic aerosols that arise from biological productivity regions, this is a picture from the Southern Ocean just for fun, but the point of this is to show the organic aerosol that come from um, biologically, rich, biologically rich oceans. So in blue on this figure on the right, we have up to maybe 20% of the submicron aerosol is organic, but during elevated chlorophyll A, 
um, periods or elevated biological productivity, we see that up to 100% of the um, aerosol can be organic. So we see a big shift in our um, composition in aerosol during phytoplankton blooms. We also know that when we capture nascent sea spray in the laboratory, we can see um, different types of microbes that exit the, the ocean and can contribute to the aerosol population. And so that, that gives us an idea of the types of particles that come out in addition to the sea salts. But we also know that the most recent parameterization um, published in 2015 used total organic carbon to estimate IMP concentrations. So the idea here is, I wanted to put this up here because not everyone thinks about the ocean like I do, um, where we have the microlayer at the surface, this was indicated in green here. The microlayer is oftentimes, but not always, enriched in organic material. And then that organic material, which is mostly like surface active um, constituents, can then be um, coated onto particles or released into the aerosol phase. And so what they did is they collected sea surface microlayer samples from the North Atlantic, which is shown here, where we have the cumulative INP concentration or ice stimulating particle number per gram of total organic carbon as a function of temperature. And they then use this to estimate INP concentrations, assuming that you know organic carbon. So they do not represent the actual transfer of this material to the aerosol phase, which is a complicated process in itself. But nevertheless, they ran modeling simulations using the uh, model by Susanna Burroughs at PNNL, where we have, um, rel where they find her marine organic aerosol concentrations are certainly elevated in, in regions like the Southern Ocean or the North Atlantic and North Pacific. And then this obviously leads to higher ion concentrations because that's where their parameterization comes from. And so um, we, we then looked at this as a few things missing. Um, while this is great um, start, we wanted to, to dig a little bit deeper because um, our laboratory studies actually suggest that it's much more complicated. So in the laboratory, the advantage is that you have almost complete control of everything that you're doing, and you can you can probe everything. And so what I have here is a very complicated cartoon that I'll walk you through, but this is um, the overall findings of two of our, our recent papers that looked at mesocosm experiments with the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Climate and the Environment, which is a chemistry center where they're interested in how phytoplankton blooms affect the climate and chemistry. And so um, we start with a phytoplankton bloom. So these are phytoplankton here. And we find that there are two possible mechanisms for creating ice nucleation material or entities in the seawater. One of them is by the breakdown of the phytoplankton because of bacteria. So the bacteria can grow in and actually cause these phytoplankton to die and break apart. So we can have um, a ion active biomass. And there's been studies to support that this is a possible um, constituent in the ion population from the marine environment. The other pathway is the production of dissolved organic carbon. So this is actually the, the byproducts of phytoplankton activity. And a lot of these are ion active macromolecules. And so these constituents then have to be transferred to the sea surface microlayer. And in the sea surface microlayer, we see um, ion activity. But these things are never directly coupled. So it has a lot to do with this. This transfer is an important piece that we don't quite have a very good quanti quantification of. And then after that enrichment, they have to be ejected into the atmosphere as sea spray aerosol, where we can measure them. And so this is, these are some SEM images, or scanning electron and micron microscopy images, of ice nucleating particles or ice crystal residuals that we collected. And we see that the mode diameter of those are around 200 to 500 nanometers. Um, and these, the number of concentrations of ice nucleating particles change throughout the bloom as well. But one of the, I think, the most important pieces is that the ion concentrations in the aerosol never are directly correlated to chlorophyll A, which is what they commonly use for biological productivity. And the bulk water, as the sea surface microlayer, and the aerosol are never on the same page. So you can constantly have different trends in your ion properties throughout the duration of a bloom, and it's very seldomly consistent. 
And then we, based on different tests that we can do in our lab, we propose two classes of marine INPs. One of them is the particulate organic carbon isonucleating particle. These are typically larger, um, and I mean uh, greater than 200 nanometers, and then they're heat labile. So they have proteins um, and things like that that are deactivated due to heating and then are no longer ion active after that. We typically think of heat labile material as being biological. And then the, the dissolved organic carbon isonucleating particles are smaller, so smaller than 200 nanometers, and they're not heat labile. They're pretty stable. So these are mostly like organic gunks, um, and they could also be, be isonucleation active uh, macromolecules. So when we compare our studies with the parameterization that I mentioned previously, we, look, we have something that looks like this, where we have our IMP per gram of total organic carbon, and this is that Wilson et al. study. And then these are three days from our MART experiment. So we have a, our sort of minimum, maximum, and a medium level of ion concentrations that we observed. And we can see that only during the highest ion concentrations can we reach the levels that were observed in the sea surface microlayer samples. Now, this experiment was an experiment where we think that our ice nucleating pop, particle population was dominated by the DOC type, the smaller size. When we look at our other experiment, where the type of INP were more dominated by the particulate organic carbon, so the larger INP types, we see an improvement in our comparison, where our highest ion concentrations are closer to that parameterization. However, um, most of the data fall far below what is predicted. However, this is still a laboratory study. It's not natural sea spray, and though we think we do a very good job of keeping it as, as real as possible. And so I want to then put forth these two gaps I think that the work that I'm going to be showing um, addresses. So first, a spatial and temporal variability and the abundance of natural marine INP is, is pretty unknown. Um, we may have some ion concentrations in remote regions, but really understanding how variable it is specifically from the marine sector is not well characterized. We also have um, no direct evidence of ocean biologically driven increases in natural marine IMP emissions. So while we have spatial correlations, we have sea surface microlayer samples, we have laboratory studies, no one's actually been able to identify this actually happening in the real environment. So that's what we set out to do. Um, and then, so just briefly, I'll go over our methods, ice nucleation me methods at CSU. The first one is the ice spectrometer, which is um, the main one I'm going to focus on today. We can measure atmospheric ice nucleating particles by collecting aerosols onto filters. And then we can also measure ice nucleating entity concentrations by looking at measurements of seawater. So this is a um, oceanography instrument where they can collect seawater at various depths in the ocean. And so you can get profiles of, of ocean water. And so we were able to collect seawater on those on, on a ship voyage. And then we process these in the lab. So in the case of an aerosol filter, we take the, remove the filter, we, we wash it in solution, um, uh, deionized water. Then we um, put this into our ice spectrometer, which has you know, 96 wells that we fill with our sample solution, and then we watch them freeze as we cool the temperature, which is shown here in D, where this is our dissolved, um, I, sorry, deionized water, where nothing has frozen, and this is our sample where we have a few wells that are frozen. Then we can, using counting statistics and other things I won't go into today, we can derive ice nucleation number concentrations in the air. And then we can use the same method for determining INE concentrations in seawater. So this is our sort of product of our lab where we have ion concentrations on the y-axis and temperature on the x. And so we have our other instrument on here, the CFDC, um, which I didn't talk about, but I can if you need more clarification on that. And then the ice spectrometer is shown as well. So we use both of these instruments in the field. And then to learn more about the composition of the particles, we do offline treatments with the ice spectrometer where, so for example, this is an untreated sample, so you can see the ice nuclei uh, spectra, and then we heat the sample for 20 minutes at 95C, and we can determine the amount of helabile material or biological material that's present in the sample. Um, and so if you have a um, mineral 
aerosol, that's, that is your ion, then you don't see a heat sensitivity. So um, this is a map showing the different ship measurements that we've conducted um, since 2012. Um, and so we have pretty good coverage over the Pacific Ocean. Um, and there's a lot of co-authors that aren't listed that contributed to this. But ice spectrometer is pretty easy to deploy, to deploy, so that it's been on all of these on all of these ship voyages. And then we also had the CFDC um, in addition to the ice spectrometer on the Capricorn project. And so this is just showing all of the data from those studies. Um, and you can see there's a quite a big range. And I've got on here the breadth of data published by that Paul, the paper by Paul that, from the introduction. And this will be on all of most of the figures just for reference so that we can keep a, remember where we are. And so you can see there's a lot of variability. And the first way that we segregate the data is by looking at the two different hemispheres. And we find that in the southern hemisphere, we have lower INP number concentrations compared to the, the, nor the northern hemisphere. Um, and this is actually a really exciting plot because we've never been able to do something like this where we can actually tell a hemispheric difference in sort of background concentrations of INP. Um, and so we're excited about working with people on looking at also like cloud phase distributions and things like that in the different hemispheres. And then to point out, um, I also have the big at all, or the big 20, 1973 data that um, I showed at the very beginning of this presentation shown in the Southern Ocean here. And the range of values that he observed in that region are quite a bit higher than what we've observed throughout the whole Southern Hemisphere, or at least in this region. Um, and I will come back to that, but I think that this is just an exciting finding in terms of sort of challenging our current understanding of what the IN concentrations are in that area. That's OK. Um, the DeMont, so, so the, 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 the breadth I'm showing there are actually sea spray aerosol measurements. Um, I have, so some of the boundary layer measurements that were in that paper were um, on the coast of California, um, on the coast of um, coasts, coastal regions versus the very remote ocean. Um, and so I think, and, there, and also mostly north, the northern hemisphere. And so I think that breadth of data is missing the southern, the really south, like really, really remote, where you don't have any terrestrial aerosol around. Um, so moving to one of my favorite um, projects that I've done is the Macehead Observatory. Um, and there's an awesome team that works there out of the National University of Ireland. And they have this facility um, here where this is the, the main, all the main instruments are lodged here, logged here. And then this is a 10 meter mass, which is where my measurements were. And we're right on the coast and they, which you can see here. And they generally, they've been doing measurements of marine aerosol there for, for decades. And so it was a, a great opportunity to go do some measurements. So this is showing again, this temperature spectrum. And this is all the data collected during that study. However, as I mentioned, the coastal areas are pretty difficult to isolate the marine, um, the marine signal from the terrestrial signal because the, the ion sources are so much different. And so this facility has a clean sector sampler, which we use where it isolates sampling to this wind range wind direction range, and then black carbon concentrations lower than the 15 micrograms per cubic centimeter. So it's really, really clean air. And we wanted to do a comparison, which is shown here, where we see, in general, our ion concentrations are lower than when we collect during the all sec sector, which is shown in the, the gray. And so now we can actually identify marine aerosol, and then any variability that's associated with that is going to be due to the chemistry and the number of concentrations of aerosol. And so they have an aerosol mass spectrometer there that your Gita runs and she's great at it. And what we found is we had one marine organic event during the month long study. Um, doing a high split back trajectory analysis, we have um, 
the air mass originating from the North Atlantic during a phytoplankton bloom. We have elevated organic mass concentrations. So while this doesn't seem very high, it's very high for this area. The days surrounding this event were around like less than 0.2 micro micrograms per cubic meter. And then the mass spectra observed during this period matched previously observed biologically driven marine organic events. So we do see an increase. It's not insane um, by any means. It's not, um, it, but it is the first time that we've seen this sort of event. And so we, we reached more and started to characterize the different IMP populations at the Mace Head Observatory. We have four different categories. So this first one is the typical IN population observed there. Um, you can see that this also falls at the lower end of that DeMont 2016 breath. Again, this is a very remote area. And then we have the marine organic IMP population. So you can see a little bit of a hump at the warmer temperatures. And then the terrestrial organic IMP population. So this is air masses that are originating from the mainland of Ireland. And Ireland has a lot of like peat and things like that. So it's really organic rich soils. And so we think that that's an important um, contributor to this type. And then you can see um, these are the highest concentrations observed at these warmer, warmer than minus 22 temperatures. And then we also have the mixtures where we have sort of our background typical IN concentrations that are then enhanced in the all sector in this warm regime, which is the terrestrial organic IN coming in. And then this is just showing the frequency of occurrence. So the, the width of these bars are the, the length of time for the different filter samples. But then this shows the, the frequency of occurrence of these different types. And so while the ion, the marine organic event was short lived, um, it is interesting that the ion concentrations are comparable to those observed in the terrestrial event. And so we're looking forward to some modeling studies on, on how that might actually have an impact on clouds, if at all. And then just a final piece in terms of characterizing, like I mentioned, we can do these heat sensitivity studies. And so this typical type, we did a heat sensitivity study and we find no statistically significant difference when we heat the sample. So this is probably more um, mineral containing INP. And then during the marine organic event, we see a significant degradation in our ion activity, which suggests that these are biological in nature. And then the terrestrial organic event um, have not been completed yet, um, but look forward to seeing that soon. And so the final um, results section is looking at ion measurements in the Southern Ocean. So this is the Capricorn study, which um, was occurring last year this time. And I'll show this video while I talk for anybody who wants to watch. Um, and this is a video showing the satellite imagery during our study, and our, we're, we're the, the red star there. But during this study, it was based out of CSIRO, out of Australia. We had the CFDC, the ice spectrometer. We also had CCN number concentrations, aerosol size distributions. And then there was a bunch of um, oceanographers on board, which was great for thinking about how biological productivity can affect ion. So we had a lot of useful discussions there, and then they also can provide some useful data. So flow cytometry can provide bacteria and um, microbe counts, and then the chlorophyll A concentrations they, they also have. Um, and so you can see the different types of clouds during our study. So we also had a LIDAR on board and then a, a micro radiometer. Um, with Jay Mace, who made this image. And I'm going to let this play out because the end of this voyage gets pretty epic. Um, and so the whole time, my instrument was located right here. Um, so you can imagine the, the sickness, but <laughs> let that play out. And that's my favorite one right there. Okay. <laughs> um, and so from this, this is a, an incredibly valuable data set, um, and we're we're excited about it. But we haven't done a ton of a ton of progress. But so we do have some preliminary results, um, which I'm going to be showing today. The total cloud cover was about 0.7. Um, this is um, from Jay Mace. So pretty cloudy region. We did see a lot of supercooled liquid. 
In general, we saw very low IMP concentrations observed um, in this region. I have a chlorophyll A map showing the chlorophyll A, oops, chlorophyll A concentrations during our voyage. So at the closer towards Tasmania, we have higher concentrations of chlorophyll A. And then um, further away, we have lower concentrations. And then um, you'll see we have a few spokes going through this um, area of depleted chlorophyll A. And this is a mesoscale oceanic eddy. So this is um, an area where there's not very much biological activity. This is one of the target areas for the oceanographers, which provided an interesting research um, avenue for me, which was great. Um, but I'm going to just compare the highest chlorophyll A concentration measurements and the lowest. And these are aerosol measurements. Um, and you can see the, the red here is the high chlorophyll A versus the low. Um, first thing is that these low, chlor these low chlorophyll A INP concentrations are extremely low. This is extremely clean air um, in terms of IN. We do see some increases um, in our elevated chlorophyll A area. Um, but again, we are closer to the land. And so we have to think more about aerosol chemistry, which we have those measurements, and we'll be working on that. But I actually had some issues with our instrument while on the ship, but it led me to be motivated to come up with a backup plan, which led to this next part. Um, and so instead of looking just at the aerosol, we are now are looking at the seawater. So now instead of looking at the actual number of concentrations, we're looking at the source potential. So are there even ice nucleating material in the ocean, in this in the Southern Ocean? Um, and so the idea here was to collect seawater using that CTD sampler throughout an, uh, one of the mesoscale oceanic eddies. And I chose the meso mesoscale oceanic eddies because it's um, actually uh, quite nice in terms of its structure. So this is the depth of the ocean. So this is 100 meters below the ocean surface. And then the transect along the oceanic eddy. And chlorophyll A is, is plotted here. So on the edges of the eddy, we have elevated chlorophyll A concentrations. And in the center, depleted. And then below the thermocline, we have extremely low chlor chlorophyll A concentrations. And so the th above the thermocline is sort of like our boundary layer. So this is where most of the mixing occurs and where if you have like any sort of non-seawater gunk, um, so biological constituents, then it, you would think that they would be more um, concentrated in the, in the above the thermocline. So the idea was that we would collect seawater doing profiles across the eddy where we have surface measurements um, going from high to low chlorophyll A, and then um, deep ocean measurements where it should be just nothing. And so these are showing temperature spectra of ice nucleating entity concentrations. And then for reference, I have measurements from seawater collected off the coast of California. And these are the measurements for the surface samples. So you, you can see, unless you really, really want to see a correlation, there isn't one. And we do not see elevated INE concentrations associated with the elevated chlorophyll A um, part of this eddy. And we also don't see super depleted IN, INE concentrations in the center of the eddy. Um, in general, there's just not very much significant variability. And so then when we look at the deep ocean samples, Again, we don't see any variability. And so this is a pretty um, unexpected result in terms of um, it doesn't actually point to a very strong link between biological activity and INE concentrations in the ocean. Um, but um, our lab studies show that it shouldn't be chlor chlorophyll A that is the, the best predictor for IN, right? And so now we're going to look more with the oceanographers and learn more about what the actual um, POC, so the particular organic carbon and or, uh, dissolved organic carbon and how those change with these different samples. So to summarize, we have a marine IMP survey for the Pacific Ocean. We see higher and more variable IMP concentrations in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere. At the Macehead Observatory, we have clean sector measurements where we know we're isolating marine aerosol. And we have the first direct evidence of elevated IN concentrations associated with the marine organic event, which is really great. 
And then we also know that the observed ion concentrations are actually comparable to those measured with terrestrial aerosol. So it, it could be a pretty important source um, if you have a lot of marine organic aerosol coming off of the North Atlantic onto the um, onto Ireland or other coastal regions. So there is potentially an influence there, but that definitely requires modeling studies and looking at other measurements. And then the Southern Ocean ice degrading particles were significantly lower than those measured by um, Keith Big in 1973, and um, which I will talk about in the next slide. And the seawater INE concentrations were not chlor correlated with our, our typical biological marker of chlorophyll A. But we do think that these mesoscale oceanic eddies provide a pretty unique venue for exploring this link, um, at least in the Southern Ocean, where things can get pretty nasty. And so um, the next steps are to apply these field measurements to numerical modeling studies. And so up first is looking at an aerosol transport model. Um, so Susanna Burroughs has done a lot of work on um, characterizing marine organic aerosol emissions and how those transport around the globe. And then we also can use the INP parameterization and then compare these to our observations. And we want to evaluate both the marine organic aerosol, which we have measurements of, and the ice nucleating particle measurements. Now, um, you know, and, and evaluate which, where things can improve. And then we also want to use this global transport model to determine if there's a significant seasonality to long-range transport to the Southern Ocean of terrestrial aerosol. So one of the possible um, reasons why we see such lower concentrations compared to Keith Big is that Keith Big may have been collecting his data in a period of significant transport. So for example, Colorado gets a lot of transport of dust from Asia in the springtime. And so maybe there's something similar to that that's occurring in the Southern Ocean that may may explain some of those discrepancies. And then um, finally, we want to, I, I'm really excited to look more at the ice phase transitioning in the Southern Ocean. So going back to this plot, looking at the, um, the difference in ice versus liquid. And so we, I would like to test the heterogeneous ice nucleation of sea spray aerosol and how that may impact ice phase transitions. Because one of the big questions right now is, you know, there's a lot of reasons why a model may not get an ice phase transition correct. Um, one of them is primary ice. And so there's also secondary ice and cloud droplet size distributions and, and turbulence and all kinds of pieces to that puzzle. And so with this data, though, we can apply um, some, no, some renewed knowledge in terms of the primary ice formation in the Southern Ocean. And so with that, I'll take any questions and thank you for coming. Um, very nice talk, Christina. Um, question about how you might reconcile, it seems you get different results from the mace head sort of INP and then the seawater INE from the Southern Ocean. And some of that's a different region, but some of it's also, it's something that's totally different. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you, can you comment on it? Is, is it not measuring the same thing? I mean, because yeah, in the seawater, exactly you're not that. measuring what comes out of the ocean. You're just measuring what's in the ocean and there may be some size selection or can you comment on some ideas I about that? I can, yeah. So, so there's actually a lot of studies now so that's come out in the last year and maybe even before that, that actually show that chlorophyll A is not a very good predictor for organic aerosol in, in itself. So any you may have enriched organic, I'm sorry, any though you have a peak in chlorophyll A, your peak in aeros uh, organic aerosol actually occurs after that because it's the, the lag of the phytoplankton dying and the phytoplankton producing all this gunk and then it has to transfer to the surface microlayer and then it can be released. And so I think, and so I think that the, while it was creative <laughs> to do those measurements in the eddies, I think that really you would need to look at like a few days downwind, downstream of the peak in chlorophyll A. Does that make sense? So an interesting experiment would be looking at INE concentrations following one parcel of water throughout the ocean and looking and see how the INE concentrations change in that sense, and then simultaneously measuring the aerosol. But yeah, it's extremely complicated. <laughs>
But isn't there also another complication here that uh, the aerosol particles that you showed as being the most, um, the organic particles uh, that were active were mainly, I think you said 200 to 500 micron or something like that, uh, 200 to 500 nanometers or so, and they would have very long transport times. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to relate uh, the ocean condition in one place to uh, the aerosol concentration above it uh, may not be quite right because you're really blending an awful lot of things in, which makes it harder. Right. Yeah, I, I, that's definitely an issue with the aerosol measurements, um, especially in a region that there might not be an incredibly rapid washing. I mean, I, I'm not sure what the lifetime of an IN would be in the Southern Ocean, um, but that's definitely an issue for understanding relating like the direct comparison. Now with the the benefit of the MACE head study though is that you you can think a little bit more about where the air mass originated because we've, we've done the high split back trajectories. So you could do that for the Southern Ocean measurements as well but yeah it's a tricky problem to to draw those drastic conclusions which is why the other parameterization is also pretty coarse in terms of how it, it treats it. On the, um, the CTD bottles, it, it looked like probably the top bottle was still a couple meters down. Is it possible that um, the stuff you're interested in is already in the micro layer and did they have a skimmer, a surface skimmer, or would you expect to see different measurements if you'd been sampling the micro layer? That's a great point. So they didn't have anyone measuring the surface micro layer because the surface micro layer measurements, like the ones that were done by Theo, they require pretty calm conditions because you have to take a little tugboat out and then put a glass the most sophisticated method that I'm aware of is putting a glass sheet and then scraping it into a funnel. So doing that in like super windy, um, wavy environment is, is not really possible. Um, so I, I don't know of any surface micro layer samples that were conducted on that ship, um, nor do I know how you would do it. But if you could, that would be an excellent piece because I think that that's one of the most enlightening parts of the, the laboratory studies that we've done, that you really have to look at all three parts of the puzzle. So. Oh, very nice and very interesting works. Um, I have three different things. Okay. <laughs> Actually, some are common, some are questions. First is about the Bix observation, because it's the 70s. I just wonder how they actually measured uh, these uh, ice, maybe particle concentration or IM particle concentration. How they how do they do it? And the second is you mentioned the CFDC uh, was also deployed in these uh, later, uh, the last uh, experiment that you show. And you also put the data on your uh, curve and just wonder how how it, uh, it was operated and how the data that you present there can be uh, consolidated with the rest of the observation. And the third one is related to the modeling. Because it seems like the current model is actually overestimating the ice in the Southern Ocean and Southern Hemisphere. And your work is more trying to quantify actually how many ice uh, nuclei and ice nuclei we have in the Southern Ocean, or you try to, to just because based on your work, it seems like we should have more ice uh, activity from these marine-borne uh, aerosols. Then that means we have we might do more. Uh, in terms of uh, the ice phase uh, uh, simulation, but it seems like we should tune that down. And I just want to see how that gap has been sure. uh, been filled with your work. Okay, I, I want to answer the last one first, just because I think that's an important distinguish. I want to make sure that this is clear. So, um, yes, the, the right now the model um, you can think of it as over glaciating the clouds. And so what what we're showing though is that the ion concentrations compared to any, so for example, if you were to look at dust or soot and how they model the ice nucleation ability of those aerosol types in a model, um, there, if you do it that same way for sea spray aerosol, you're gonna drastically overestimate your ion activity because what we're showing is that the sea spray aerosol is actually extremely, extremely low in terms of its ice nucleation ability. And so what this is, what I'm proposing is that if we treat the sea spray aerosol as it's real true ice nucleation um, ability where it isn't a good ice nucleator, 
then maybe we can do a better job um, because right now we are over nucleating. Does that make sure. does that make sense? Is that better? Okay. Um, and then the idea behind linking it to the biological activity is that the Southern Ocean, in terms of regions where an increase by a factor of five or 10 or 15 or whatever it is that you get with biological activity, in terms of an area that would be most sensitive to that, it would be the Southern Ocean. Um, somewhere you know, in the Northern Hemisphere isn't gonna be as, just because you're absent of other ion, ion sources. And so that's why we're looking in the Southern Ocean and seeing if this link is actually there because Keith Biggs data suggests that it is. Um, so then for his measurements, they were on a ship, they collected aerosol, um, the notes taken for that and like the details of the methods are, are actually not very well reported. Um, but from piecing various things together, you can, you can kind of come up with a story where they have aerosol filters, um, they have a, a cold stage, um, and they determine ion concentrations using that. Um, all of the analysis were done by techs, so we don't actually know like too much about it. Um, and then for the CFTC, we, um, so I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, I can actually show you. So it's the continuous flow diffusion chamber, and it's shown on the right here. We operate in a immersion freezing or condensation followed by freezing mode. They're similar, but somewhat different where we pull aerosol through the chamber. Um, it's, a, it's two cylindrical um, tubes. And we pull aerosol through those two, um, those two walls. One of the walls, the inner column, is um, set at a cooler temperature than the outer wall. Both walls are covered in ice. And so that's where you have your vapor water source. And we um, keep this at super cold conditions and then relative humidity of like five and a half to 7%. So we're in this immersion or condensation followed by freezing mode. So once the aerosol enters the, the chamber, particles will um, activate a CCN and then form cloud droplets. And then if they are an ice nucleation or ice nuclei, then it will nucleate into an ice crystal. And then the bottom of our instrument is the evaporation region where both walls are set to the same temperature. So this allows, and again, they're still coated in ice. So it allows ice saturation and then water subsaturation. So that evaporates your cloud droplets and then it leaves your ice crystals remaining. So the assumption here is that you have one IN per, per droplet and um, that your droplets fully evaporate, which we can, set, we can detect all of that. And then at the bottom of that, we have an optical particle counter that measures the size distribution of the hydrometeors and aerosol that come out of there at the base of the, the chamber. And so you can see these are the, the larger hydrometeors or the ice crystals, and then the um, evaporated droplets are, are here. So then we can distinguish that and then count ice crystal concentrations. And then we actually, I showed those images at the beginning, we can collect the ice crystals using impaction and then look at them after they've evaporated. We can look at the residual that remains and, and get an idea of their composition. So, More questions? Sure. I have a question about that last slide with the Calypso data. Um, I guess I wonder a little bit uh, how much the sensitivities of Calypso kind of play into that because it's sort of a binary thing with Calypso. So does mixed phase change how you assess uh, biases in, in liquid and ice phase in, uh, in the cloud distributions? So that's a great question. I, I don't know a lot about LIDAR or Calypso, but I've, I've done a lot of reading recently from preparing other proposals and things. Um, and we had a LIDAR on board the ship um, in general, satellites do pretty bad even at detecting clouds in the Southern Ocean. A lot of this is because um, they, the, they're attenuated before they go all the way through the cloud. So they're pretty optically thick clouds. Um, and so when we compare a LIDAR measurement going from the bottom up to LIDAR coming from space down, we see pretty big discrepancies. Um, and so 
Yeah. Oh, okay. And so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is my understanding. I'm not a LiDAR person at all. This is my understanding. Um, and so there's a lot of ideas on like why that might be. So one of them is you have really large droplets. So one thing that was really bizarre is we, we oftentimes saw like super cool drizzle um, was almost always occurring in these clouds. Um, and so it's just, it's pretty, it's a pretty unique environment, which is why I showed, I showed the Calypso, but I also showed the, the CMIP3 um, simulate, or the CMIP3 results. Does that kind of answer your question? So what you said is correct, but what is usually done, and I don't know if it's, it's not in Gen K's measurements, but in the more recent stuff that we're using from the active sensors, you combine the LiDAR with a radar. Mm. And then when you do that, you see where the LiDAR attenuates. The LiDAR gives you um, backscatter information, which tells you the, basically if you've got solid particles or refractive particles, and then the um, radar is sensitive to size. So as you get these larger particles, you see the radar, you don't even see the ice. But if you put them together, which you can do from space or from the ground, you tend to get a good, pretty good vertical structure. And the nice part is the active sensors uniquely for satellite instruments give you very fine vertical structure. So these thin layer clouds, which are only a couple hundred meters, kilometer thick, you can still get vertical information from space, which you can't really do with any other sensor. So there's some combined products mm -hmm. that give you phase information based on both of them. That's actually pretty good. And that does pretty much in these clouds give you, the radar does kind of go through all the way through it, even if the LiDAR gets attenuated. And apropos, the radar space doesn't work well when you get really close to the ground. So if these are... You know, if you start to have super cool drizzle all the way to the ground, then things start to get a little nuts. Yeah. So a lot of precipitation people, like one of my good friends is a precipitation guy for satellites. They, like, really struggle in the Southern Ocean, too. I mean, I think it's challenging, from which is why Socrates is so exciting. Well, there's another satellite for that. GPM. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Christina, I have a completely different question. OK. Uh, that is. I mean, you talked about all the biological activity in the uh, 100 meters or so of the uh, ocean layer above the thermocline. And um, somehow you had a process in there that uh, all those INEs would migrate to the surface layer. What do you know about this process? Why would they migrate to the surface layer? And how much is the hypothesis in there? OK, so um, there's a lot of work being done on the interface between <laughs> interface between the bulk water, the sea surface microlayer. Sea, sea surface microlayer is like micron thick, and then the aerosol. So there's a lot of work going into that. And what the current, my current knowledge, which a lot of people are doing this in the center that we're part of, um, is that the surface active material, so you can get these things that can combine and agglomerate, and they become these massive macromolecules, but then they can, they can transfer and float because they're these surf surface active. So they can then rise to the, that surface layer. Now, the, that's all in laboratory studies. So what actually happens in nature may be much more complicated because you have mixing due to wind speeds and wave breaking and things like that. And so um, it's a, um, I think it's an important mechanism in calm waters, but maybe not as you wouldn't necessarily have as much enrichment in that stuff in really mixed environments like the Southern Ocean. Mm -hmm. Yes, any more questions? Okay, let's thank Christina again. Thank you. Thank you.